Organizations around central Illinois that help victims of domestic violence and sexual abuse are seeing funding reduced from the federal government. We'll tell you why that's putting a burden on those trying to help the victims and what it could mean for services in the future. But first, our Phil Luciano shows us some sobering statistics about domestic violence. All right, thanks Phil Luciano for sharing those troubling statistics with us. Right now, we want to introduce you to Carol Myrna. She is the CEO of the Center for Prevention of Abuse. Good to see you, Carol. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. You guys do a lot for the community, and I know the word abuse encompasses a lot. It does. Uh, probably more than people realize. So can you kind of give us an overview of what your organization does? The Center for Prevention of Abuse is an amazing place. We're the only agency in the entire state of Illinois that has all the sanctioned services that we do under one roof. And that really works well for us. Um, we started as a rape crisis hotline and we maintain that hotline 50 years later um, and have never stopped. So we're the sexual assault and sexual abuse services, domestic violence, we have two emergency shelters, elder abuse, abuse of adults living with disabilities, human trafficking is the newest department, and then we've got a very large prevention education department where we try very hard to stop abuse before it starts. And that includes bullying, right? Anti-bullying. Um, we have a human trafficking curriculum for uh, junior high kids. Everything that we do through prevention education is age appropriate and evidence-based, comprehensive. It's about keeping kids safe. Why are we lucky enough to have all that under one roof? It seems like we should have more <laughs> places like this across the state. Well, it makes good sense. And we actually have a lot of visitors from across the state that go on a tour and say the same thing. The agency is unique in the sense that we've had really wonderful leaders in the past that saw the value of having these cooperative services in one location. So, but say elder abuse um, and in our domestic violence shelter, our first man that stayed in our shelter came from our elder abuse program. So it all is very cooperative and it makes perfect sense for us. And financially, it makes good sense for us to have that many services. Tell us a little bit about if, if someone, let, let's say domestic violence, mm -hmm. a, a spouse is abusing another spouse, how does it work? Do you, do you recommend that person call the police first or you first or how, how does that work? Every case is different. Okay. Um, if somebody's in imminent danger, by all means, calling local law enforcement 911 is the absolute best thing to do. But if someone is two o'clock in the morning, able to use the phone, able to break away from their abuser, to have a conversation about safety. Um, safety planning is one of the first things that we do with somebody that comes to us, because we know that people that are in abusive relationships typically leave that relationship seven or eight times before they finally come to terms with it. It's very difficult to leave an abusive relationship. We know that it takes a lot of courage and it should take quite a bit of planning. Um, we know that when 
uh, someone leaves an abusive situation, they are 70 times more likely to be murdered by that partner because abuse is all about power and control. And if you're leaving an abusive situation, that, ab that abuser is losing control. Mm -hmm. So uh, they act out how they do, but we work very hard to try to keep people safe at all levels. So if someone calls us, um, they're able to do it during the work day or the middle of the night, and we talk about what's the safest room in your house. Do you have any funds uh, allocated that you can take with you when you leave? Because most people are abused or financially abused. Um, do you have children? Do you have someone that you can signal for help if you need to? Do you have a phone um, that isn't owned by the abuser? Um, anything like that that might help them gain a little bit of independence to be able to come to the Center for Prevention of Abuse or a shelter somewhere um, to gain some, some safety and some help. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the kids and the financial aspect because mm -hmm. I know people who have stayed in an abusive relationship because they have a pet. Yeah, absolutely. They don't know what they're going to do with their pet. Yeah, well, we have a pet peace program for that specific reason. Mm -hmm. We've been granted funds if somebody comes to us that um, Tender Hearts Animal Hospital will not only make sure that the pet is the dog or the cat is up to date on their shots, but they'll also keep them there while the person's staying with us, seeking some healing and some hope. So we know that pets are abused, especially when somebody leaves the home. So I would be that person. I would want to bring my dog with me. So I understand that completely. But children are an integral part of the planning um, for a couple of different reasons. We know that 26% of all children witness or are involved in a traumatic event by the age of four. And they carry that with them for the rest of their lives. So we work with kids through our Safe From The Start program, through our therapeutic services, through our children's room, to really work with them about processing the abuse that they've encountered. But we have to get them there before that can happen. So we include them in the safety planning. We include them in um, offering to, you want to come stay with us? By all means, bring the children. Um, whatever services they might need, we work with them to help determine what those are and then who we can help to, to bring that hope. Sure. And I want to talk a little bit more uh, in a few minutes about services, but first, this obviously costs money. Can you tell us a little bit about how the center is funded? Center for Prevention of Abuse relies very heavily on state and federal sources. So about 75% of our $9 million budget comes from public sources. Um, but we have a very large supportive audience in the community that believes in the work that we do and knows the value of what we've brought to the community for the last 50 years. So our donations and charitable sources are extremely important to us. But those state and federal dollars typically fund things that are very, very difficult to talk about. Um, sexual abuse, elder abuse, those are hard conversations to have. And very rarely will you have someone that'll say, I want to fund uh, sexual assault. So the, the federal government has always done that, and so has the state government. Mm -hmm. So we rely on their generosity. Well, the federal government has something that is called the Victims of Crime Act. And through that, uh, organizations like yours get funding through the Crime Victims Fund. But I understand that that uh, amount of funding is being lowered, or has been lowered. Since 2017, it's reduced 92%. And it serves about 6 million individuals, victims of crime. And it's not taxpayer dollars. These are funds that come from prosecutorial fees and court fines and from federal criminals. So it's a really good use of those dollars. And um, we use it very wisely. It funds therapy services, medical advocacies when we're called to the hospital because someone's presented for domestic violence or human trafficking or sexual assault. It funds um, children's services. It funds some prevention education. And it serves um, many agencies that serve victims of crime across the country. So it's certainly not just the Center for Prevention of Abuse, but we do rely on it. But some agencies who are smaller than ours rely on it a lot more than we do. Last year, we took a $555,000 cut in the Victims of Crime Act dollars, and Congress just finished passing the fiscal year 24 budget, and we're in line to take another 35% cut. 
have there's, has there been an explanation as to why? Because those funds have depleted, especially during the pandemic, when um, the way that people were prosecuted and um, sentences were determined changed, mm -hmm. and those fees were not coming in as as plentiful as they were before. So that fee has gradually reduced. What really needs to happen is there needs to be a um, a new way to fund the Victims of Crime Act, or we need to work with the court system to help them learn, you know, how beneficial it is to bring those fines and fees in. Because um, it really does help the people that they're trying to help. Sure. But it is, it's, it's hurting a lot of agencies, which subsequently hurts a lot of victims. Um, we're going to see agencies that are going to lose satellite offices that are going to reduce hours on their crisis hotline. Ours operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's staffed by people who are well trained at our Peoria facility. Um, I would hate to see that diminish, but there are agencies that because of what's happened, unless another source of funds comes in, we're going to see their services shut down. Speaking of which, uh, the YWCA of McLean County has a program called Stepping Stones, mm -hmm. which is a, a rape crisis uh, center for the community, and their decrease was more than $325,000. They've actually had to get help from the McLean County government to make sure they can still give those services, right. and how long that help will last, uh, we're not sure. Have you had to make any specific cuts because of this cut in funding? We've been very fortunate. Um, Leader Jahan Gordon Booth was very helpful to us last year to keep us whole um, so that we wouldn't have to make dramatic cuts. That was not necessarily sustainable. We don't know if that's going to ever happen again. So those cuts will continue. Um, fortunately, we save for a rainy day, but that doesn't mean that we want to deplete our reserves. We want to stay as solid as we possibly can to be in existence for as long as we can. So we'll probably keep the public informed about what our needs are. Um, everybody says it. Peoria is a very generous community. It is. I've seen it. I believe it. Um, and I think that we'll probably be okay, but we're going to rely on the people that see those services in action every day. When you have that type of funding cut and you have to look at your books and look at the services you provide, that has got to be so difficult to decide if we have to get rid of something, what do we get rid of? I mean, that's got to right. be heartbreaking. Well, everything that we do is essential. And even during the pandemic, we were declared an essential service, complete an operation as, as effective as we are now. We were during the whole pandemic. So um, there is nothing that is gravy that I would call that we can take off the plate. Mm -hmm. um, everything is very important. And typically what happens is uh, you reduce the size of your staff, which is not anything that I want to do. It's not anything I believe in doing. I think that the numbers don't necessarily save you. It's the people that save you. Mm -hmm. So, and we have wonderful superheroes that work with people and help them through their healing process. And we can't afford to lose any of them. Well, thankfully, in, in an organization like yours, the people that work there, they're not doing it for the glory or the no. money. They're doing it because <laughs> they believe in what they're doing. So right. if you have to give them a little extra work, uh, I guess that's your ideal situation, having folks like that that are dedicated to the cause. I said to the management team yesterday, we meet regularly, um, and somebody said, oh, I don't have much to report today. And then at the end, I said, I beg to differ. You all have so much work, you don't know what to do. There is so much on your plate. They bring tremendous value to what they do and the people that they serve. So um, I would hate to try to dump more on their plate because that shows in the bottom line of service. And we need to spend as much time as we can with people in therapy and with people in counseling and with people who are staying with us as guests in our shelter. They deserve all of our attention and as much as we can give it. You touched on it briefly earlier. Is it is it difficult to go to a big business in the Peoria area and say, hey, you know, <laughs> we, we need some funding? Because, you know, those businesses, they are very charitable, but uh, the Center for Prevention of Abuse, it's a different kind of animal. Yeah, it's a, it's a different dynamic. Um, it's difficult, yes and no. It's not always comfortable to sure. do that, but I think that the companies in the area and even individuals in the area really understand the value of the work that gets done at the Center for Prevention of Abuse. We have some longtime, very generous 
um, people that support us, whether it's Pekin Insurance or Caterpillar or you name it, we've got wonderful folks. Bob Lindsay, um, The Paradise is a big one. So yes, we go to them regularly and they're always there for us, but they run into difficult times too. So we always need to save for a rainy day. So we take as much as we can and set it aside to make sure that we're there we went through a 736 day state budget impasse and we lived through that. Um, and we were able to withstand the uncertainty of whether we were gonna get paid or not paid. So um, we're prepared as much as we can, but um, we still rely on the people that are always generous to us. Absolutely. Uh, we showed those numbers at the beginning uh, the domestic violence in America, the numbers are unbelievable. You've been with the center now for nine years. It's been in existence a lot longer than that. Are we seeing any improvement in these numbers or is the problem just consistent, getting worse? Um, I don't know that it gets worse. I, I like to put a positive spin on that because when I, we see more numbers and we're seeing about 6,000 people a year through the Center for Prevention of Abuse not counting the prevention education where we reach 41,000 students. Those numbers continue to grow. We continue to increase our capacity as we can, but I think it would be foolish for me to think that domestic violence will ever go away. Um, it's always exist existed and I think it will always be there, but we see things that improve. I think more people are understanding that they can come to the center for help. They're understanding that there are options. Um, they're understanding that the resources are available and there's always going to be somebody there to listen to them and to say, we believe you and we're here for you. I think it's going to be interesting in five to ten years looking at the outreach you're doing now with younger people to see what these numbers are like. Again, these are national numbers we showed you, but you know, you could make a, a big difference in, in how you mold young people to think so when they grow up to adults, hopefully they will... Uh, the cycle of violence is very real. When um, we know that a young boy um, has a 10% more likelihood of becoming an abuser because he's been in a home where abuse happened, that's the cycle of violence. And a young girl, it's the same situation. She could become an abuser, but she is far more likely to be subjected to abuse and sexual abuse. So when we can teach kids about body safety, we can teach them when they come into therapy how to regulate their feelings and maybe just to come to terms with what's happened to them or what they've seen. It makes a difference. We're hosting a conference in May called Light 2024 where we shine a light on childhood trauma. It's become so prevalent in the understanding of um, a mental health situation in school or uh, anything to do with children and trauma. We have wonderful speakers and workshops that are gonna take place in East Peoria, um, nationally known speakers. Because we have that institutional knowledge, we're very lucky to have that. So um, being able to provide those tools, those resources, whether it's internally at the center or because we're hosting a conference, um, we're very lucky to be able to do that. I think we will see better numbers. I think we will. I observed, I'm gonna interrupt you sure. just for a second. I observed um, our prevention educators um, at a local grade school and it was a third grade class and they knew the teacher, our prevention educator coming in because they recognized her from second grade and first grade. So there was relationship that was being built. But as she was presenting the lesson of the day, there was a little boy and he said, Miss Laura, are we talking about empathy? And he knew the word empathy before I understood that we were talking about empathy, which is fantastic. We couldn't ask for anything better than that. For an eight-year-old to understand what empathy is because we've provided that step up in education on it for the last three years of their lives, we couldn't ask for anything better. That kid's got a lot of chance ahead of him. Good, that's a great story. I wanna hear some other success stories. I know you hear terrible things every day, but I want to hear some success stories out of the Center for Prevention of Abuse. We have a success story. Um, we were talking about this yesterday. Probably every hour of every day, there's something that we can really just enlighten someone's day about the work that we do. Um, a story that always comes to mind for me is um, I don't always see the people that come to the center. We have a lot of staff that work with them directly, but um, a woman asked to see me specifically and sat down and told me the story about being abused for 20 years. 
afraid to leave her situation because you have to think about what are you leaving? She was leaving home. She was leaving family. She was leaving financial security. But then what was she running to? She was running to uncertainty. She was running to poverty. She was running to fear because fear of leaving someone who is that controlling is very real. It's big. Um, but she told me for the last 10 years of the abuse, the abuser would send her to the grocery store with a very specific list of groceries to get with the exact amount of money that they believed would need to be spent. Sometimes she'd find a coupon, she'd come back with an extra 75 cents, and she'd hide that money under the carpet in the spare bedroom. And it was to get respite, her form of respite was to go get a, a cup of coffee somewhere. Um, but it was sitting in a coffee shop that someone told her about, the Center for Prevention of Abuse, where she was able to safety plan, where she was able to learn about her choices and her options. And out of a 20-year relationship, she was able to find the courage and the voice to break away. And that is a very difficult thing to do. Um, there's something that I like to tell people about. They say, well, why, doesn't, why wouldn't she just leave five years into the relationship instead of waiting 20? It was all of those things about what she running to, fear, uncertainty. And when you leave an abusive relationship and, and the, the fear of maybe even losing your life is very real, it's like seeing the shark's fin in the water. And you know it's dangerous, but as long as you can see it, you have some, some sense of safety because you can tell how far away that, that attack might be. And she told me um, that when um, that fin goes under the water, and you no longer have a sense of when that attack will happen. That's what it's like leaving that abusive relationship. So I've never forgotten that. But she was able to find hope and healing and she's still in the area and I run into her occasionally and I'm very proud of what she's accomplished. I don't use the word empowering people because they've always had the power. We might embolden them um, and we don't rescue people. They rescue themselves. We just facilitate it. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, people that say, oh, why didn't you just do that? Well, much easier said than done. Well, we're in the cheap seats. Right. We, <clears throat> we have a different perspective, and it's practicing that empathy mm -hmm. that that eight-year-old is beginning to understand. But being able to see things from the abused person's perspective and not blame them for what they're enduring, um, that perspective is really important. Well, some of these abusers, uh, they have a psychological hold over people, and sometimes that's a lot scarier and more powerful than physicality, if you can get some inside somebody's head. Absolutely, um, and f abuse isn't always just physical. It's, it is emotional, it could be gaslighting, it could be a number of, of uh, tactics that people use to control somebody else. Human trafficking is about force, fraud, or coercion, and it does, it gets inside your head and makes you believe that you owe your abuser money, you owe them your time. Everything that isn't true um, is somehow brought into the forefront of that person's brain. But um, we always try to help people gain the education they need so they can come to their own decisions about what they can and cannot do and gain that independence hopefully in the long run. It's always their choice. Well, again, we are glad we have a facility like yours here in central Illinois. And we appreciate your, the work that you do, and we hope those funds come in. Thank you. Appreciate you, Mark. All right, Carol. Appreciate you, too. Phil Luciano joins us now. And, Phil, those numbers that you dug up for us at the very beginning of the show, pretty startling. It, it, it's astounding. I mean, we know how horrible uh, the problem is of abuse, right? But then you see 20,000 calls a day to domestic abuse hotlines. You see that 20 people a minute are abused by partners. And what's in that black and white, you're like, wow, that is just mind blowing. So hopefully funding and everything else can move in the right direction. Yeah, we need at least as much as we've been getting, if not more. Right. 
Well, let's transition now to uh, our favorite show, You've Got to See This, which starts in just a few minutes, all new episode. We have a really interesting story that I think leads it off. It's about a Peoria firefighter who for more than two decades has been saving lives there, but now he also has another avocation where he helps lives. He's a painter, and he helps people through grief and other really heavy emotions, and to see how he does this, it's really kind of touching. And you've got a story about one of the most famous aviators in American history, right? Yeah, Charles Lindbergh, he has got a storied history here in central Illinois. I would say it's not bad news because he lived, but he crashed twice, twice in central Illinois and walked away. Learned how to bounce. Learned how to bounce, yes. <laughs> bounce off a of barbed wire in one instance. <laughs> but we're going to tell you about where he crashed and some monuments that have been built to uh, commemorate the occasion. And also, and I know everyone's still excited that today is National 8-Track Tape Day. I don't know if you got off work. I, <laughs> <laughs> I did <There's>... not. <laughs> we should, right? Yes. But if you haven't yet celebrated, we have a special salute to 8-Tracks coming up on the show. Now, do you have just one 8-Track player? I have one 8-Track player that works, but I have okay. others that are waiting for their moment in the sun. So. All right, waiting to be refurbished? Yes, sir. Next, nice. next man up, next deck up. The kids that are watching don't know what cassettes and records are, <laughs> let alone an 8-track, right. so you get a history lesson here. <laughs> Very good. All right. Thank you, Phil. Well, that is our time for now. We appreciate you watching. You can get with us anytime at WTVP.org, and be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram. We've always got a lot of cool stuff on there that you won't see on WTVP television. Again, thanks for joining us. Have a good night. <laughs>